Over the past couple of months, for me, I've walked through uh, so many amazing times, right? Some, uh, you know, some amazing moments, some challenging moments, activity, busyness, right? Tragedy, uh, anybody faced some tragedy in the last couple months? Uh, you know, highs, lows, you've been on the mountaintop, you've experienced a, a deep low, like whatever it might be, right? You've walked through all those things. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I look back and I really didn't get quite enough rest over the last couple months. You know, summer should be a time to rest, right? Y'all agree? Maybe not. It should be a time of relaxation. It should be a time of vacation. It should be a time of reprieve and, and just kind of time out for a little bit. Well, I, I don't think for, I, well, I don't think, I know for me, I didn't get enough rest and relaxation. I certainly did and didn't, but I'll tell you what, that being said, I'm looking forward to the season ahead, right? Right? School starts, if it hasn't already started for your kiddos or your grandkiddos or for yourself, uh, and school starting, and with the start of school and with the fall season, we get into this new, like, rhythm, right? We get into what I would call a season of rhythm and routine. You know, I don't, I don't have a lot of rhythm. You don't want to get me on a rhythm guitar because I'll just mess you up. You don't want to get me on drums because my rhythm is... Is a little bit more, uh, yeah, not a rhythm. But in any case, right, uh, we're getting into the season where, it, where it's, it goes from kind of rest and relaxation focus to now we're getting into routine. We're getting settled into a, a season of routine, a season of rhythm. And speaking of which, I believe that God has some great things in store for us in the coming weeks, in the coming months. In the message last week, I asked a very critical question, what are you living for? What are you living for? What are you living for? It's a very critical question. It's a challenging question, and I hope and pray that you really considered that question and the focus of your life as you walk throughout the week this week. And so I pray that you look, took seriously our takeaway from last week to live every day with eternity in mind. Live every day with eternity in mind. Live every day with eternity in mind. So many times we can live our lives in a, in, in a place where ultimately we are living for the here and now. We're living for today, right? In fact, I don't know about you, but uh, most days I wake up thinking about food. Anybody else? And then, you know, here's the funny thing. If you're anything like my family or you're anything like, you know, uh, you know people I'm around, there's just something about like you're, you're eating lunch and you're talking about what you're going to have for dinner, Right? You're always anticipating what is ahead. You're always thinking about the future. You're always thinking about what's to come. And so uh, the the challenge is, is are we living in the moment and are we living every day with eternity in mind? Are we living with eternity in mind? Are we thinking through not just how am I going to get through my day? Are we thinking through, you know, what is going to be the trajectory of my entire life? When my life is done, when I am, have lived a full life here on earth, what will life be like on the other side of eternity? And how often do we stop to consider what is my life, what am I living for? Am I just living for the here and now? Am I just living for today? Am I just living to get to my next meal, my next payday, you know, next month, whatever it might be? Am I just living for the here and now? And so in all of our living, we must not forget to live for a future that far exceeds the lifetime that we live here on earth. Jesus taught us, right? He said that we should store up for ourselves, and this is again from last week, we should store up for ourselves treasures in heaven, right? Not just treasures here on earth, not just the here and now. And and let me just say, by the way, God is not against us having things. He's just against things having us. Big difference. I'm going to talk about that in a couple weeks. And if you've been around Junction Community Church at all, you've heard me talk about that over and over again. And and the truth is, is that uh, God is really not interested whether we have stuff or not, whether we accumulate things. Really, he's interested if those things have us, right? And, and for me, I just like, I want to give it all away, you know, like I want to give it all the way. I want none of that to be a factor in my life when I think about eternity, right? Because this stuff will all pass away, all of the stuff, all of the things. And so Jesus taught us to store our treasures in heaven and to live with eternity in mind. And our lives are truthfully, as we've talked about in the last couple of weeks, just a mist. It's a vanishing mist, like our lives are here for a moment and then we're gone. I want to live each day for that which lasts forever, not just what lasts in this lifetime. And so in the middle of what we talked about last week, I encouraged rest. I encouraged prioritizing the Sabbath to ensure we honor the Lord and, and not only honor the Lord with that command, but then we operate in optimal health. Like 
You want to be at your best? Like, honestly, you want to be at your best mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually? Let me give you one word of advice. Sleep. Sleep. Yeah, it's a great thing. Some of y'all can sleep in. I envy you. I don't know what it's like to sleep in, and sometimes I try. I try to sleep in, and I find myself just going like, okay, this is stupid. Just get up, you know, but I try. Every once in a while, I'll get one of those days where I sleep in, and it's incredible. Like, I know it's going to be a good day for the rest of the day. It usually happens on a day off like once a year. But the point is this, rest, right? And it's a command of the Lord. In fact, remember, it's not only his command, but he commanded it because he knows that we need it. He knows that we need rest. And I want to continue that thought this morning uh, with really highlighting this reality of the need for rest in our lives. I want to highlight it. I want to talk about it. And I want to continue that thought in a brand new message series that we're simply calling B. B. That's it. Two letters. B. E. That's it. That's what we're going to talk about for the next five weeks, B. And if you didn't notice, if you've never been there, this is a picture I took a couple years ago at Hanging Lake. Beautiful place. Who knows what it looks like right now, but we're just going to believe that it's still beautiful and that we still get to visit it from time to time. But B, that's the title of this series. And I want to discover several thoughts over the next five weeks, and I want to encourage you, if you're, if you're here for the start, it's always good when we start a series. You're here at the beginning. So I want to encourage you for the next five weeks to say I'm all in. I, I, I mean, I don't know if I'll be here after that, but I'm here for the next five weeks. I don't know where I'll be the sixth week from today, but in five weeks, I know that I'll be here, including today, right? And so I want to encourage you to commit to this series with us. And as we begin it today, we're going to deal with a simple two-word phrase, and it's this, be still. Be still. This is an interesting phrase, which reminds me of every toddler in life, right? Because every toddler knows how to sit still and be quiet. Right? Right? Toddlers just have a hard time sitting still. They're, they're into everything, and they, they do what they're not supposed to do. They put in their mouth things that they're not supposed to put in their mouth, and they're like, no, don't eat that. That's a cockroach. Uh, you don't want to eat that. But it moves. It's enticing me. Come and eat me. Every, t- every toddler just has a hard time sitting down. You know, I, I, I have an interesting story about my dad. My dad is one of those guys who's always busy, still to this day, at uh, his ripe young age. Oh, well, yeah, I'll just give it away. Sorry, dad. 68 years old, you know. He's still at this stage where he's just go, go, go. He's busy all the time. And in fact, his name is not Dennis. It's actually Paul. But when he was a kid, there was a character on the radio called Dennis the menace. And miss, if you know anything about Dennis the Menace, he's always into things, right? He's always doing things. And, and of course, there's the classic movies. I love watching it, you know, Mr. Wilson, you know, classic. But it's go, go, go. And every toddler is doing that. There, there's a bunch of Dennis's inside of us, right? And we just are always touching, always doing, always opening cabinets we shouldn't open and, and, and doing all kinds of things like that. Every toddler does it. About the only time that they are silent is when they're asleep or when they're outside of your presence. In fact, let me just say this. Whenever a toddler is quiet, you know something's wrong. Because unless there's chatter and busyness and clacking of things and shaking of things and noise, if there's silence with the toddler, uh uh-oh, you better be on call. Because I guarantee you're about to find a mess or you're about to find them ingesting something they shouldn't eat, right? That's just the nature of it. And do we ever grow out of that? That's my question for us this morning. Do we ever grow out of being a toddler? We live in a world that is constantly on the go. We live in a world where it's constantly go, 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 go. It never stops. It never stops. You know, we were waiting for a moment where we just get a break. In fact, I said summer should be, you know, a time of rest and relaxation. And you all looked at me like I said something foreign. 
Because we are this four-letter word. It's a bad word in my opinion. We're all busy, right? We encounter somebody, we ask them, how are you doing? And they say, busy. How's life going? Busy. Busy. It's a bad word. We live with our minds constantly on the go and we are consuming way more content, content than is necessary. I am seriously getting to the point where I don't want one of these anymore. Anybody else? Like some of y'all like, you're crazy. Yeah, I'm crazy. I'll admit it. I'm ready for it. I'm ready for crazy. I'm tired of that phone. I'm tired of notification. Do yourself a favor. If you have all your notifications off, shut them on, shut them off. It's peaceful. It's not ding and noise and I want and give me your time and let me sell you something. Uh, you know, it's, it's just anyway, like I'm getting ahead of this whole series right now. But the point is, is we're overwhelmed, we're overworked, we're busy, we're running late, we're on the go, we're exhausted, and we're almost on the verge of burning out. Because that's just the way life is. Be still in 2021? Are you crazy? Be still. And so what do we do? How do we address this, uh, this ever-challenging world we live in? How do we confront this, this constant go that we find ourselves in? I want to go to God's Word and find insight and instruction for the busy lives we live. In fact, we're going to go to Psalm. We're going to be looking at the 46th Psalm. We're not going to read it yet, but we're going to go there. And what I love about the Psalms is that they're calming and they're peaceful. They're, they're, they're these poetic, you know, amazing uh, references of, of, of theology and scripture and relationship with God and songs that should be sung. And, and so they're, 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 they're these beautiful, artistic masterpieces. And they often speak calm over our chaotic souls. In them, we find rest. You know, how many of y'all like to speed read? How many of y'all don't even like to read? Let's be honest. You just listen, and you listen on 1.25 or 1.5 or, or 2.0 if you're really fast. It's like, what did they say? I don't know, but I read the book. You see, there's something about poetry. You have to read it slowly. You have to ponder it. What is the author saying? What is he, why is he using these uh, an analogies? And why is he using these uh, word uh, structures? And why is, why is he going from one stanza to the next? And what is he trying to communicate? And when we read poetry, we pause, we reflect, we slow down. You know, you can't read poetry real fast. You have to slow down to take it all in and pick apart the pieces, right? And so that's what we do when we come to the book of Psalm. And we realize that many of these psalms were written as a song. They were written for moments of worship. Today, that's what we're going to read. In Psalm 46, it is literally a song that was written that would be utilized in maybe a public gathering like we worship today and we sing songs. Maybe it would be utilized like that. Uh, maybe it would be utilized in personal devotion when you're by yourself and you take a time to really just, uh, you know, worship the Lord on your own. Not sure what it might be, but it was a song. And so let's read it. And I want to encourage us, let's read it a little bit slow, okay? Uh, slow is not a bad thing. Slow is a very good thing. God is our refuge and strength. God is our refuge and strength. You see, oftentimes because of the pace of our lives, we want to read it like this. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear the other... Uh, we just want to rush through things. We just want to get to it. I, I mean, I know you all, like, when the, when the red light comes, you're just, like, cursing red lights, you know, because we're always in a hurry, right? You all know if there's two lines and there's cars and there's two over here and there's one over here, what, line are you, what lane are you pulling into? Come on. Let's be honest. God is our refuge and strength. He's our refuge. God is our refuge and strength. An ever-present help in trouble. When trouble comes our way, not if, when trouble comes our way, God is present. He is there. He is ever-present. He is always there. God is our refuge. He's our strength. An ever-present help in trouble. Man, I've been in trouble before in my life many times. Oftentimes, my own fault. Amen? 
My own fault. I'm in trouble. I'm in that moment. I'm in that situation. And I'm in trouble. And I'm realizing, like, God, where are you? God, I need you right now because I'm in trouble. Right? God is an ever-present help in trouble. He is our refuge. We run to him. We find, we find refuge in him. He is our strength. When you don't have the strength to continue on, when you feel like, I can't get through this day, when times I feel like I can't get through another Sunday because I've been doing it for 14 years, and what am I going to say that I haven't said in 14 years? <laughs> God, give me your strength. Therefore, it goes on, and the song continues by saying, we will, will not fear. These statements, as we read them slowly, are powerful and pointed. They're, they don't have excuses built in. They're not, they're not contingent upon. They're declarations of faith. And, and they're saying, therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. We spent some, I spent some time on the mountains this weekend. Can you imagine the mountains falling into the sea? Can you imagine earthquakes and great, uh, you know, natural catastrophes taking place? There's something awe-inspiring and fear-inspiring about that. But it's saying here that even if the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, guess what? It reads on. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Though all this is going on, though there's natural disasters around us, though there's all kinds, have you ever been thrown by a wave in your life in the ocean? There's something scary about water. That's the perfect word, scary. There's something, you know, I've had a couple of moments with water where I realized that, like, I don't care how strong I am, water is powerful. If you ever have fallen in a class four rapids river and, and you all of a sudden you realize they tell you to lift your feet up, float, float. I ain't floating, I'm dying. <laughs> and that water just throws you around and you can hear the, feel the rocks smacking your leg and you're just kind of going through and you're just, you know, you, you, you realize how powerful water is. You realize the power of the scripture that though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging you ever been like in the ocean and, you know, you get caught in the undertow and you get smacked on the bottom of the floor, uh, uh, the ocean floor, right? Yeah, there's something powerful about that. And it goes on and it, and, and, and it changes course a little bit. It says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The city of God is a reference to Jerusalem physically here on earth. It's a reference to that. The city of God is the place where God makes his dwelling on earth. But guess what? God isn't just interested in making a dwelling on earth. There's a dwelling in heaven. There's eternity that awaits us. And so we have to realize that. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy place where... The most high dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. It's speaking about the city. God will help her at break of day. God is help, again, an ever-present help in time of trouble. The city of Jerusalem has been besieged many times throughout human history. Its walls have fallen. It's, 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 there's been all kinds of chaos that have come against the city of Jerusalem. But what we're really realizing here is that we're not just talking about the physical uh, earth Earthly uh, Jerusalem, we're talking about the eternal state of where God will dwell. It says this, look, verse 6, nations are in an uproar, kingdoms fall. Ha. He lifts his voice. Listen to this, let me, verse 6 again. Nations are in uproar. How many of you know that there's nations in an uproar, that our nation is in an uproar, that our world is going through a pandemic that doesn't seem to just go away? How many of y'all just want it to go away? Like just, okay, enough. Enough is enough. No more. Just go away. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts away when he lifts, when he speaks. Here's the thing. Clue into this. That all this is happening, all the chaos, and yet it's the voice of the Lord. It's, it's when God speaks that, that he speaks with power, he speaks with authority. Verse 7, the Lord Almighty is with us. Again, the reminder, God is with us. Remind yourself this morning, God is with you. I know what it's like to feel alone. 
I know what it's like to feel completely alone, to feel like you have nowhere to turn, no one to talk to. Like, you know, there's people all in the room, but somehow in the midst of a crowd, you still feel alone. Anybody? And so in the middle of that, the Lord Almighty is with us. We are not alone. The God of Jacob is our, is our fortress. He's not only our refuge that we run to, but he's also a fortress around us that says, back off. This is my son. This is my daughter. This is my child. I have purposes and plans for their lives. He's a fortress. He says, come and see what the Lord has done, the, uh, the desolations he has brought on the earth. It goes on to read and it says, he makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. And before we read on, well, let's just read it. He says, be, be still. And know that I am God. What he's saying is, look, I am sovereign over nature and nations. I'm sovereign over humanity and I'm sovereign over the, even, even uh, nature. When we look at the natural disasters of the world and we look at all that goes on in our chaotic, creative world. When we see the, the beauty of creation and the awe and the wonder of it and the fear that it instills in our hearts at times. Guess what? God is sovereign over nature and he's sovereign over nations. He's sovereign over people and he's sovereign over the created world that we live in. He is sovereign all by himself. He reigns supreme. He is full of authority. And he says this, be still and know that I am God. Be still. He commands it. He doesn't say, hey, pick up, you know, like think about it. He, he makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He doesn't say, uh, you know what, you're, gonna, you're on your own in this one. You have to fig figure it out. He doesn't do that, no. He says, be still and know that I am God. It reads on and concludes here. It says, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted again, uh, among the earth. Again, he is exalted. He alone is God most high. Remember earlier and it said, God Almighty, it said earlier also, he is the most high, that he dwells in the city. He's the most high. He's above nations and nature. Verse 11, the Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. It repeats it once again. God is with us. God is with us. God is with you. God is with us right now. He's in, uh, with us in this moment. He's, he, you know, let me say this about Junction Community Church. God was with us in 1931 when this church started. He was with us in 2007 when there was a big transition. And, and I came to pastor the church. And Pastor Leha went on to, uh, to, to what God had called him to. God was with us then. God was with us 14 years ago. He was with us seven years ago. God was with us two years ago. Guess what? God was with us in the middle of 2020 of the pandemic and all the other things, God is not only with us then, he's with us now. He's with you. He's with me. He's with us. God is with us. He is the Almighty, again, supreme over nations and nature, so sovereign over all things. And he tells us in the middle of that to be still. Yeah, God, I would, but uh, I've got too much to do. God, I would be still, but uh, did you just see that notification I got? I've been waiting to hear from her for a long time. It's been like a whole 45 seconds. You see, look, you know, I, I, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but I'm probably going to get sidetracked here. My wife is amazing. <clears throat> What you don't know about this woman is that yesterday morning, she had to wake up to go to a 40-minute meeting for her dad at the care facility that he's at in Albuquerque yesterday. So she woke up 6 o'clock. She got on the road. She drove eight hours, speeding like crazy. Just kidding. <clears throat> she had a little dinner. She ate uh, well. One of my favorite places in Albuquerque, Monroe's. She slept a couple of hours, woke up at one in the morning to be here at church on time with us to worship. Yeah. That's just who she is. She's not looking for an award, although she deserves one. 
a prize, a gift, or any of those things. She just does it. Quiet, quiet, with intention and focus, that's who she is. And I, I realize that in our lives, we get so distracted with so many things. We get so focused on this, that, or the other. We get, and what we really need to do is just be still, be in the moment. She was in the moment. She did what she had to do. She's there, and then she's here. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, be safe. Not only that, but a couple months ago or a couple weeks, what has it been? Only like four weeks, maybe? She went over Red Mountain Pass, and she had the fright of her life. I've never seen her afraid. Like when she's driving, she's like, she's just a crazy driver. She is a crazy driver. I'm the calm driver in our home, trust me. When we're deciding who wants to drive, I always pick me. Because when she drives, I'm stressed out. She's not afraid, though. Drove, drove over Red Mountain Pass. She got halfway there at Silverton, and she was like, can we get a room here? Because it was storming that night. There was surges, and there was like, I mean, it was crazy. And I'm like, girl, buck up. You're in my, you're in my truck. Four-wheel drive, you got this. I've never seen her afraid, but guess what? She went over that pass twice in the last 24 hours. Again, didn't hold her back, didn't stop her. And she did it in a car, compact car, no less. All right, back to the message. Be still. God is sovereign. And in the middle of all of our doing and busyness, God is, is really what we have to remind ourselves is that he, he's telling us to be still, but we say, but we got so much. So, so you're waiting for the 45-second message that, that you know, like, or, you know, you're waiting for that notification to pop up. Trust me, over the last 24 hours, I kept waiting for the notifications from her. Because I'm like, babe, like, where are you? Are you safe? Are you okay? Are you on the road? You know, are you going to make it back? You should just stay. You should be safe, but I want to see you. But no, you know, okay. And we're living in this world that's distracted, notifications. While we've been in this room, I, I don't know how many of you have touched your phone probably a hundred times. Wondering, you know, what are we doing? Where are we going? How, you know, what was that? Oh, that was Facebook. That was, that was Facebook telling me that Junction Community Church is live. Yeah, we know you're here. We live in a distracted world, but at the end of the day, what I'm getting to is that the word of the Lord is here, and what he's saying to us is be still. Be still. But it is so difficult. It is so difficult to be still because we constantly are driven by the go, 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 go culture of our lives. The notifications of the phone, the, all the things. I, I'm challenging myself with this because I want to be different. I want to this message is, is going to, this series is going to be good, but let me, let me stay on course here. All right, be still. This is actually a repeat message, one which the Lord spoke to the Israelites as they were making their exodus out of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 14 and verse 14, the Lord declares, the Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. There it is again. It's a repeat message, and so when we get to Psalm 46, God is just really saying what he already said in Exodus chapter 14, verse 14, because the people were dealing with a chaotic situation, an oppressive situation, a situation where they were, uh, where, where they were oppressed, where they were slaves, where they were ridiculed, where they, were, they had no freedoms. They were dealing with a desperate situation, and in the middle of that situation, as they're going through it, as they're walking through that, guess what? They're about to come out, and they're afraid. What about if the, what if the Israelites or, uh, or, I'm sorry, what if the Egyptians do this, that, and the other, and they're worried about how are they going to, you know, make it out of Egypt, and how are they going to do this? And what does the Lord say? The Lord will fight for you. You need only do what? Be still. Yeah, yeah, Lord, but I have a sword. I don't need it. Yes, Lord, but I, but I, but I got a lot of faith. Really? I don't need it. Lord, I, Lord I, got a, I got a lot of money. I don't need it. Uh, Lord, I got, I, I, I got good looks. You got a face only a mother can love. Yeah. 
Lord, I got, Lord, here, here's what I have. And the Lord is basically saying in the middle of the battle, in the middle of the fight, in the middle when everybody's told you that you can't and you won't and you've been knocked down too many times to remember and you're saying, where, where, how am I going to get through this? How am I going to fight? The Lord is saying, I'm going to fight for you. I'm the one that's going to go to battle for you. All you need to do is be still. Be still. Be still. Lord, that's too easy. <laughs> You see, this is a message that not only we see in Psalm 46, and not only do we see it in, uh, in Exodus chapter uh, 14, verse 14, but it's a message which Jesus declared also in the New Testament. And let me just catch, catch us up to speed, and then we're going to read one verse. And here's what the story is. is Jesus is hanging out with his disciples, and they're doing a lot of good things, and he's teaching them, and he's proclaiming. And they decide that they're going to go from one area to another area, but they have to go by boat, and they, get, they all jump in a boat, and there's several boats actually with them. There's a lot of people traveling, and Jesus is getting ready to do what? Take a nap. <laughs> he's getting ready to actually, in that moment of his life, to be still. He gets in the boat, he climbs on in, the disciples, because they all know how to work boats and they were fishermen, they decide, well, let's get this boat going. They start crossing and all of a sudden it says that there was this violent squall that comes on the sea. So much so that the waves started to come over the boat, it says that it almost sunk. Can you imagine that? And guess what? The whole time Jesus is frantically worried about what's happening. He's asleep. He's like, whoo. I can only imagine, you know, what that moment was like. He was not frantic. He was still. He was resting. He was asleep. He wasn't looking at his phone. He wasn't, he wasn't using GPS to tell us, you know, how do we get around this wave? He was asleep. He was still. And then the disciples come and they wake him up and they're, Jesus, your kids ever wake you up and you're just like, oh, you <laughs> happens all the time. It's like your kids walk in the room and you think like, what's going on? <laughs> Sorry, camera guys. Danny's good though. He gets it. It's like, you know, they wake him up, Jesus. And then this is what they say to Jesus. Do you not even care that we're about to drown? Jesus, how many of y'all, let's be honest, sometimes you look at Jesus and you say, Jesus, do you even care that I'm drowning here? Do you even care that my marriage is falling apart? Do you even care that my kids are a wreck? Do you even care that my finances, do you even care? Are you even there? Are you even real? Do you even care? And they wake him up, Jesus, frantic and in chaos of heart and soul and situation. And they're saying, Jesus, where are you? And guess what? He wakes up and he responds in verse 39, Mark chapter 4. And he says this, he got up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. You see... In the middle of our lives, as we're going through the storms of life, if we're going through all the things, as we're frantically trying to figure out the storm, as we're frantically trying to decide and decipher and do all of these things, all we really need to do is be still. And in that moment, we need to more than ever before, I think in our culture, in our society, in our lives, more than ever before, we need to learn this ancient practice of just sitting still before the Lord. Just be still. God, I want to be still, but I am a toddler, and I want to touch things. God, I want to fix things. Lord, I want to lay hands on people and choke them unconscious. And watch them sleep involuntarily. It's the greatest thing in the world. No. In the middle of all of that, we need to be still. And we need to trust God. Jesus absolutely cares about us in the middle of our, in the storms of our lives. He absolutely cares. It's so easy to think that he's forgotten us. Listen to this. 
If you're watching online, if you're in this building, listen to this, the replay later, wherever you're at, listen to this. Jesus absolutely cares about you, not your storm. Sometimes we say things like, the Lord cares about my storms. Really, he doesn't care about your storm. He cares about you. And in the middle of that, you're frantically trying to figure it out, and you're looking at the situation, and, and, and man, I'm, I mean, I'm saying, I want to say a word here, but like, you're, I don't want to upset anybody. And you're really ticked off. You're really upset about life, about somebody, about a situation. You're looking at somebody, you're like, goodness, you know. Or you're looking at yourself and you're disappointed or whatever the case is. You're going through all that chaos, all that wreck, all that mess. And in the middle of it, you're trying to frantically figure it out. The way, the way I look at it is like, you know, and there's several examples in scripture. But it's just like you're busy, busy, busy trying to just do. Yeah. Deep breath. But I can't. I'm a toddler. I want to touch things. Don't you remember? I want to fix things because I'm a fixer. And the Lord is saying to you and I today, be still. So as we close, life can come one chaotic storm after another. At times we are overwhelmed, overworked, and filled with all sorts of anxiety. In fact, that word, when you hear anxiety, like something just like stirred in you and you know what I'm talking about. However, we must keep in mind that God is sovereign over nations and nature. He is all-powerful, almighty. With just one command, he can calm our hearts and the storms of our lives. With just one word, he can calm. With just one word. And therefore, I remind us once again to be still. Trust in the Lord as our mighty fortress. To be still before the Lord is practically realized in moments of prayer and places where we eliminate the noise of life. Let me say that again because you need to hear this. To be still before the Lord is practically realized in moments of prayer and places where we eliminate the noise of this life. Eliminate the noise. Turn off the notifications. Put down the phone. You know, one of the best things I've done in the last year of my life is moments where I just literally take the phone, I put it in my drawer, and I don't see it for 24 hours. Woo! It's exciting. And then I get back, and I see it once again. We begin 21 days of prayer tonight at 6 o'clock, and we'll spend an hour in prayer and in worship, setting the tone for the next 21 days. And here's the truth. I beseech you to join us tonight. If you cannot physically be here the rest of the 21 days, that's fine. This is just an emphasis of 21 days. But be here tonight. We're going to worship together. We're going to pray together. We're going we're to believe God together. And we're going to set the tone for 21 days. We're going to pray. We're going to seek God. And then here's the way the schedule looks, just so you, you're aware. We start tonight at 6 o'clock. And then Monday through Friday, we'll meet here at 7 o'clock in the evening for an hour of prayer. On, on uh, Friday nights, we'll have a time of worship and prayer. And then on Saturday mornings, we're going to have online prayer. You can join us on all of our platforms, and we'll pray in that capacity. So I want to encourage you, dig on in. It starts today. There's no need for any other takeaway today than the simple two-word command from the Lord to be still. That's it. We don't need a fancy takeaway. We don't need something that's kind of like just be still. Just do it. Just do it. Be still. I don't know. I, I do know that you find that practically in prayer and meditation before the Lord and spending time. But, but, but to be still, sometimes you have to just put away the things. Don't go to the bathroom if you're a parent. Your kids will follow you there. Go to their room. They won't follow you there. Find a place. Get away, get alone, and be still. So do not forget, in all of your doing and all of our living, we cannot do what the Lord does. 
He alone is sovereign over nature and nations. He alone can calm the storms of life. He alone can calm the chaos in our hearts. Our frantic pace and efforts often only add to the chaos of our lives. Therefore, once again, I say, be still. When we are still, the voice of Almighty God can speak stillness over the storms of our lives. Therefore, be still and let the Lord do what only he can. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for strength that comes from you because you are our refuge. You are our fortress. You fight battles for us, Lord. God, your word is powerful. What great reminders. But Lord, if we're ever going to be still before you, it's about us surrendering to you. Because we know that when we surrender, that you take our lives and you do the impossible with them. We know that surrender begins in trusting you with our souls. It begins in us encountering true salvation and healing from you, God. For everyone listening to the sound of my voice, if you've never confessed your faith in Christ, I want to give you that opportunity today. If you say, that's me, I need to confess my faith in Christ today. Would you lift your hand right where you're at? If there's anybody here, you say, that's me. I need to commit my life to Christ. I need to confess my faith in him. If there's anybody online, would you please let us know? And then would you pray a simple prayer, something like this that says, God, I surrender all. All my life, all that I am to you and you alone. I put my faith in you, Jesus. I will serve you and follow you. Teach me your ways, God. Teach me to be still. When I want to frantically run after my own mess of a mind, of a heart, of a situation that's chaotic. Lord, teach me to simply be still. I pray this in Jesus' name.